Welcome to Restoration RV. I'm your host, Stephanie Dean, your resident communications professor and travel nerd. I've been traveling my entire life, living in everything from teepees to campers all over the U.S. to hostels in the Alps and hotels overlooking the gorgeous beaches of Greece. I'm currently in the southeast of the U.S. looking for my next restoration project and trying to live as sustainably as possible, which is what this podcast is all about, renovation, minimizing, and sustainability. Welcome to episode number four. Today, we're going to talk about the basics of boondocking. Boondocking can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. I've heard it called dry camping, camping without hookups, um, camping in the boonies. I've, call, I've heard it called frog hopping by one person. But basically what it is, it's camping without full hookups. So you're self-sustained. Uh, you can be doing it while you're hopping from one place to another and you stay in like a Walmart parking lot, although not as many Walmarts let you anymore, or a Cabela's or a Crackle Barrel or a rest stop or a truck stop, but don't get in the way of the trucks. Um, but more than often than not, what people are talking about when they're talking about boondocking is you're self-sustained in a place kind of out in the boonies. Um on land that's not somebody's land. Well, I guess it's somebody's land if you have permission. Don't do it if you don't have permission. But places like um, BLM land or United States Forest Service land or the Army Corps of Engineers land. In the U.S., we have 650 million acres of public land. And it's most of that, I would say, is in the western states. So boondocking is much more plentiful there. And if you look up boondocking on YouTube or on the internet, most people you see doing it are actually doing it out there just because it's pretty easy to find. It's harder to find in the South and the East just because we're a much more populated area and there's not as many places. Um, The ratio of people to land is just more difficult. You have to look a bit harder for it, but it is there, especially Tennessee has a lot of Army Corps of Engineer areas. So, Some of the advantages of boondocking is that you can put your home in the most scenic places that you think of. Um, If you think about when you go to like an RV park, and even if you go to the Grand Canyon, or if you go to um, RV parks outside of Niagara Falls, any of these places that you think of, oh, I'm going to this amazing scenic place, and then you drive into an RV campground, I mean, there's going to be pros and cons with that or boondocking. Some of the pros of an RV park is you have hookups. You don't have to think about how much energy or how much water you're consuming. But then some of the cons are your views are basically someone's rig next to you. Um, Or they could have really loud kids or they can have dogs. Or this summer we were in this gorgeous place right outside of Colorado Springs, um, Woodland Park. And the man in this rig next to us would get up at seven in the morning and talk on his cell phone as l- so loud, woke everybody up every morning talking on his cell phone while his tiny, tiny dogs yapped. That kind of thing is, is annoying and discouraging to um, those of us who are in these places for reasons not cell phone related. So boondocking, some of the, the um, huge pros of that are you can put your, your rig um, – nearly anywhere in some of the most scenic gorgeous places that you can think of but the cons of course are the trade-off and there's a trade-off if you're into rv life there's a trade-off for everything right if you want a big rig you're going to trade off portability if you want a small rig you're going to trade off comfort there's always a trade you just got to figure out what's right for you so with boondocking the trade-off is you've got to be really conscious of how much energy you're using and how much um of other resources you're using like water So today we're going to talk about some myths of boondocking. We're going to talk about some essentials for boondocking and a little bit of boondocking 101. Uh, This is going to be a three-part mini series. So today we're going to talk about just kind of the how-tos and, you know, how to help you get on the road as quickly as possible. Next week, we're going to have an interview with um, someone who happens to be my brother, (laughs) Josh, who used to go and, and travel between the U.S., the south of the U.S., to Yellowstone and back every summer when um, when he was college age because he worked out in Yellowstone and and he has wonderful stories about car camping and boondocking and um, Jackson Hole and just like these great stories. So we're going to talk to him next week about um, how he did that and kind of the things he did to sustain himself while he was on this epic road trip. And then uh, the last and final of the three in this series will be about 
how you find places to boondock, apps that can help you, and um, ways to kind of prep for that. So today is kind of what it is. Tomorrow is real life story, or tomorrow, not tomorrow. I mean, you can come back tomorrow, but you'll have to listen to the same (laughs) episode. Next week is real life story. And then the final week is um, apps and how to find places. So uh, let's talk about some of the myths of boondocking. There are some myths about boondocking that make people scared. And granted, I was scared too. Like the, the epic road trip we took this summer was all, ex- with the ex- no, it was all. I was going to say with the exception of one stop on our nearly month-long journey um, was RV parks. But I take it back. One of them was actually still, it wasn't really traditionally boondocking. We were dry camping, but we were dry camping in a state park with other rigs, even though we couldn't really see them. So it was kind of this weird hybrid of boondocking and RV park. But some of the myths that keep a lot of people from boondocking, myself included until recently, um, there's enough of a bit of truth in them to seem plausible and seem scary, but with a little preparation, aren't really that big of a deal. So the first one is that it's more dangerous than RV parks. And yes and no. I mean, if you're going to meet scary, bad people everywhere in life and you're going to meet amazing people everywhere in life, you're around a higher concentration of people in an RV park and the likelihood of meeting a not very nice person is higher just because statistically you're in a, a larger group of people. Whereas boondocking you hopefully aren't going to see anyone around you. Um, people don't know necessarily know where you are, and um, you're just not going to run into as many people. So statistically, you're less likely to run into the scary bad people. Um, so it's not necessarily more dangerous than RV parks. In fact, if you look at the statistics, not just the ones that I mentioned about you know the number of people versus the number that uh, are around you, there are less issues and problems with people boondocking than there are in RV parks. The second one is that it's illegal, but it's actually not. If you're on public land, it is legal and sometimes even, especially on BLM land, um, encouraged. There are rules. Every place has rules. Look them up before you go. For example, on BLM land, you have 14 days. You can stay there for 14 days before you have to move on. Now you can just move on down the road, literally, but you have to move on from the space that you're in. Um, you don't throw out your gray water ever, 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 ever. So make sure, you know, if you take it in, you take it out or pack it in and pack it out. That goes with your RV too. Um, be aware of the rules, you know, keeping your animals on leashes can be a, a one that's pretty common. Be aware of the rules for the specific areas that you're in and follow them. Um, in, in a minute, we're going to talk a, in our 101 section about some of the, the things that you should do just to be nice to other people that happen to be in the area as well. Um, those aren't necessarily rules, more just like how to be a nice person. Um, and then the third one that's a common myth is that you won't be able to sustain yourself or your, or your rig. And that's only an issue if you aren't watching how you use things. So do some test runs, do a test run in your driveway. Um, try to see how much water you're consuming be aware that if you take a shower, that's going to take more water than if you're just uh, washing dishes and washing your hands and using the bathroom. So think about how much water you're using and thinking and think about the power that you're using. I've mentioned this a couple of times, but it's super important. You may not have lights on your last day if you've run your battery all down all day by charging everything that you own. So you're going to have to be aware of your power consumption and then how you return power to your rig. And we'll talk about that in a second too. So of course, these are all myths. There's enough, you know, truth to them to make them uh, mythical. (laughs) But if you educate yourself on how to boondock safely and you think consciously about what you're doing while you're there, those are all easily, easily um, hurdle, 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 they're easily, (laughs) easy hurdles to overcome. Goodness, it's late and my tongue is twisted, but we'll get through this. Um, some, some boondocking essentials, some things that you need to think about every time you go. So you always want to think about, I've got four of them here. You've got water, power, food, and how you're going to climate control. So water, if you're boondocking, you want to make sure that you have water. Now you, I've heard many times people say, well, you don't want to travel with water. You don't want to travel with water. And if you don't travel with water, then you need to make sure that before you get to a point of no return of, of, you know, way out in your boonies that you've somehow procured the water that you need, 
or go ahead and fill up your tanks and just be aware that it's going to cut down your gas mileage. Um, I have one of the things we did our our cross country road trip because of gas mileage this summer was a little pop up, which ended up being a, a great little rig for this. And we put water um, in our tank and then drove oh, quite a while and ended up wearing our tires down in a, in a not good way. So you have to be aware of kind of what the tank does to your your tires and where it's placed. Um, I think our water tank is just in a bad place. So from now on, we don't travel with water. We get water when, when we're close to there um, instead of going hundreds, hundreds of miles on it. So think about water. Think about your drinking water versus your everything else water. Like, do you have water to flush your toilet with, to wash your hands with, to wash your dishes with versus the water you're going to drink? And that can make a difference if you're going to use, you know, stream water to replenish some of your just hand washing water or um, what is the fresh water you're going to drink from. So just be aware of, you know, where your water comes from and what you're going to use it for. Power. So there's two main ways to go. Um, In your rig, you have a battery or a set of batteries that are either 6 volt, 12 volt or 24 volt, depending on the size of your rig. The 6 volts are going to be hooked up so they become a 12 volt um, So mainly 12 and 24. If you have the larger, larger coaches, you're going to use 24 volt system. If you have the smaller rigs, you're going to use a 12 volt system usually. So um, how you get power back into those batteries is important. And there's two main ways. There's solar panels or there's a generator. What's important about that is the size of your batteries, how many amp hours you have, what kind of battery. And this is a whole different episode, so I'm trying <laughs> I'm trying to just kind of give you the, the general gist. If you have regular batteries, not lithium, but regular batteries, you can use half the amp hours. You should only drain your battery down to half. If you drain it any more than half, you're going to kill your battery faster. Now, if you have lithium batteries, you can drain it pretty much all the way down. So say you have a 100 amp hour battery, that's pretty standard. So you can go 50 amp hours or 50 hours um, using that battery. So if you have light bulbs, I would recommend changing over to LED. It takes a lot less. You can get them cheap, cheap on Amazon. But um, think about what you're using and how many hours a day you're using them and how much wattage it takes. Which sounds horribly complicated, and it kind of is, but if you do some test runs, you should know. You should be able to figure it out. On a regular 100 amp hour battery, going, you should be able to kind of get through, I would say, a weekend, no problem, using your lights and using, you know, charging like your cell phone when it needs it or your iPad when it needs it. I wouldn't go crazy charging things, but those kind of little things you should be fine with. Now, you can get power back into your battery through solar panels. And this is a really common way. You can either mount solar to your roof, solar panels to your roof, or you can have a suitcase. And both of these, you have to find a way to get that power then into your battery and then uh, a way for you to convert that battery energy to your electronics through um, uh, some kind of, well, it's a box. You have the converter usually in your rig, but you need a different kind for solar. Um, again, <laughs> this is really complicated. I'm trying to make. I'm trying to kind of simplify it some. Another way, of course, is a generator. Now you can use the gas generators, or you can use generators on rigs if you have the larger rig. Um, a lot of people swear by generators. If you're boondocking and you've got people within earshot of you, don't run your generator late at night. Don't run it all hours of the day. Um, for one thing, it takes a ridiculous amount of gas. But also that's just being kind of rude. You know, most people are out there boondocking to get away into nature and hear really pretty things like the crickets. So think about that. It's a great backup to have if you need it. But be aware of your surroundings always and think about when you're running it, how late you're running it and how often you're running it. Um, Food, what kind of food you have and how you're going to cook it. Canned goods go a lot farther, of course, than uh, things you have to keep refrigerated. But if you are keeping things refrigerated, You've got your cooler or your fridge. Some of those take propane. Some of it takes battery. Um, Coolers take ice. If you're using propane to cook your food or if you're using induction cooking, which again takes power. Um, So these are things to be aware of when you're planning 
how much power it all it all kind of comes down to your your resources how much power it's going to take to run you for as long as you want to be out the ways to get the power back in and uh that includes, you know, when you're thinking about the way that you prepare your food. The most common way to prepare food is, of course, is using propane. It's easy. It's cheap. You can get those huge things that you mount to the front of your rig. You can get the small one-person burners if you want to cook outside of your rig. Um, but you, that's definitely an essential you want to have. You want to have a way to cook your food um, or heat up the food if you prepared it ahead of time. And then the final one, we've talked about water. We've talked about power. We've talked about how to prepare your food. The final one, of course, is climate control. Now, this one is um, a, a bear of an issue. <laughs> you, in, the, in the summertime, you, know, you can lower your windows and, and try to work with the heat and the cold of the day, or you can run your air conditioner. Now, you can't run your air conditioner without a generator or without a lot of solar, like 800 plus watts of solar. So think about that when, just because you have an air conditioner in your rig doesn't mean that you're going to be able to use it when you're boondocking. That is one of the pros of going to an RV park. You plug into electricity, voila, you have all the things you need. So uh, air conditioning tends to be the hardest part. The winter parts, um, well, depending on where you go. If you're going to go to Alaska in the winter, of course, it's going to be a different story than if you go to Alabama in the winter. So how you heat things basically is through propane or through wood stoves. Wood stoves are becoming more and more popular as an option in RVs. These usually are aftermarket um, items that you put in. I have seen some of the newer fancy pants rigs with electric stoves that act like wood stoves, but you can put an old-fashioned, uh, really beautiful wood stove in your rig, run a stove pipe, and, and there you go. It's a great option for being off grid and it run it uses pretty tiny sticks. You can use pellets too, but also, you know, almost not quite kindling, but almost that's pretty easily available in most places. So between the water, the power, how you cook the food and how you cool your food or preserve your food and climate control, those are the main things that you really need to plan through and think through. And I made it sound so much more complicated than it is, but you want to test run those systems so you have that down before you get way out there. So once you're there, you've got those things, you've done your test run, you're ready to go. What are some of the things you need to think about to be a good boondocking neighbor? So let me talk about some boondocking 101s. I've said this in every little section and I'll, I'll keep saying it because it's important. Conserve what you bring. Plan what you're going to bring. Make sure you don't use everything that you brought all at once. It's so easy to go, oh my gosh, it's hot and sweaty. I didn't think about air conditioning. I'm going to take a cool shower. And then you do that every day and your water's gone. So think about how much you're using and conserve. And then be able to plan out the remaining days that you have with the remaining resources that you have. It's just kind of, it's common sense, you know. Safety. No, and I'm not talking about people safety as much as, um, well, somewhat, you know, be aware of your surroundings, but also um, the safety of where you are and, and things like wildfires or flash floods. These things happen. I mean, they happen out west all the time, unfortunately. If you're boondocking and you're not in a park, not just an RV park at all, but even a state park or something like that, you don't have rangers there to tell you, hey, by the way, that smoke over the ridge, that's a wildfire, you need to leave now. Or you don't have someone saying, hey, this looks like a really cool place to, to boondock or to camp, but this is actually a really common place for flash floods, you probably shouldn't camp here. You don't have those people kind of helping you with the safety of, of your surroundings. So be aware of your surroundings. And with that, know the size of your rig in combination with your surroundings. So are you too heavy to get back into the place that you want to go back into? Not just now when you're in good conditions, but think about if it rains overnight and suddenly you're in this muddy soup of a road, can your rig then get back out? Um, think about, are you going to tear off your roof with branches? <laughs> that happens more often than you would think. Or if you can't find a good place to boondock on this road, is there a place for you to turn around? Is your rig too big to turn around on this road? Or even when you want to leave, is there a place for you to get out and turn around? 
Um, if you're not sure and you think this could be really the, the road you want to go down and the place you want to look at, literally get out of your rig and walk it. See, um, it, it's definitely, you know, as long as you don't have a line of people behind you, that's not an issue. It's not a problem because it's so much better than, than having to call a tow truck that costs, if you even if you can get them out there when you're boondocking, costs so much money to get them out there. So just use your head, think about the safety, be aware of your surroundings. When you go, leave no trace. Uh, what is it they say? Leave nothing but fo- footprints, take nothing but memories. Stick to existing roads, especially if you're heavy. Don't make new fire rings if you don't have to. Work with the existing, uh, I mean, don't have a fire outside of a fire ring, period. <laughs> but if there are existing fire rings, use those. Don't make new ones. Um, don't dump your tanks on the ground. Even if you think you're using the really good soap, don't dump your tanks on the ground. It's just rude. Obey the rules. Are you in BLM land? Do you need to move after 14 days? Um, Do you have people that are near you so you need to be a good neighbor? Don't. One of the big kind of unspoken rules, or actually spoken quite a bit on YouTube, with uh, if you have a neighbor near you when you're boondocking, don't park right next to them. If they wanted to park right next to someone, they would have gone to the campgrounds or they would have gone to the RV parks. Make sure you're staying far enough away from them. Don't run your generator all the time. Don't let your kids run around or your animals run off leash um, when you've got other people around you. Just be a good neighbor. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's something that I think we need to do more and more um, as a species. So as long as you are obeying the rules for the land you're on, you're leaving no trace, you're thinking about your surroundings, you're being a good neighbor, you're aware of what you're consuming Um, You're aware of how much power and water and how to preserve your food and how to climate control. You're going to be okay. Do it. Give it a try. There are some absolutely stunning, gorgeous places out there to look. So thanks for listening to Restoration RV with me, your traveling host, Steph. I upload every Tuesday about all things travel, sustainability, and healthy living on the road. If you like the show and want to know more, check out my website at restorationrv.net or leave me a review on iTunes. Join me next week when we talk to Josh Hendrick as he tells us about his boondocking trip across the U.S. when he worked at Yellowstone National Park. We're going to talk about tips and tricks for staying safe and healthy on the road. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next week.